it's interesting to look at the fact that in Israel, we've just had after four rounds of elections, we've just seen a new coalition formed. I'm Lucy Kotzer Ellenbogen, director of the Israeli Palestinian Conflict Program at the US Institute of Peace. And I am Hisham Youssef, senior fellow at the United States Institute of Peace. I'm a retired Egyptian diplomat, and I worked for many years at the Arab League and Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Today, we're going to be talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, where recent events, including the turmoil in Jerusalem and the 11-day war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza, has really forced the issue back uh, to international attention. Uh, we've covered many aspects of this conflict in several articles on the USIP website. But in this video, we wanted to reflect on some of the big picture issues and trends that we have been following. Hisham, you and I have spent a lot of time talking about the way different assumptions have shifted over the years in relation to this conflict and the way it's going to be resolved. One of those, of course, is what was the perceived inevitability of the two-state solution. Is that paradigm still viable? I think that this paradigm is still enduring. Uh, it has weakened uh, among both Israelis and Palestinians, as you know. Uh, but I think this happened out of despair that the likelihood of achieving this objective is becoming more and more elusive. And people working on resolving this conflict have been searching for other solutions for years, but none has achieved the level of support of the two-state solution. I think more recently, the war on Gaza also resulted in reconfirming aspects that we already knew, like that the status quo cannot be maintained. But some assumptions no longer hold, uh, like that you can continue to separate Gaza, the West Bank, and Jerusalem, or that Israeli Arabs will remain sidelined, uh, or that Israeli policies can continue against Jerusalemites without them revolting. Uh, I think that these changes have to be taken into consideration. But Lucy, what do you think are the assumptions that are shifting from your perspective? You know, there's a couple of interesting points uh, you've raised there, Hisham, and I think if I can just go back first though to the one of the points you raised about uh, support or lack thereof for the two-state solution, I, I agree with you that there is, um, this is born out of despair. When you look at the, the numbers, the polling of Israelis and Palestinians, uh, support for a two-state solution has definitely gone down. When you poll Israelis and Palestinians about the alternatives to two states, you know, one state of some kind of description, there are, there are sort of many uh, conceptions of what that could be. A confederation model is another one that people have increasingly started talking about. Um, when, when you look at all those alternatives, still the one that gets the plurality of support from both sides is two states. And I think that's because you see each side coming to the realization that it's it's possibly the only way that really addresses the different demands and concerns of both sides. It's just that neither thinks they can uh, get there. And each side really blames the other in the mirror image sort of way that we don't have a partner to peace on the other side. So what are we supposed to do? And in light of what you said, you think that the Oslo framework is still relevant or is it dead? You know, that question, I, I think, gets gets asked a lot. So, you know, is Oslo dead? And I often see that as really the proxy question. I think what people are asking there is, is the two-state solution dead off? And I think that's how people think of that. Um, and it's understandable for the reasons we just discussed why that question is coming up. I think the challenge is that Oslo is, is very much alive in the sense that the agreements it put into place, all the agreements that stemmed from Oslo, um, which governed really how Israelis and Palestinians interact with each other, economic affairs, civil affairs, security affairs, those are still very much um, governing the way those interactions happen. And so to deconstruct those um, is a significant challenge. When Oslo was signed, the idea was that this would be a five-year interim agreement that would eventually lead to a final status agreement. So these agreements that were put in place were really seen as temporary. And now here we are over two decades later, and they're still operating in this way. So to the question of is Oslo dead, um, for good or ill, it, it's not. Um, there's a lot of disentangling to do if, 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 if we're to throw that model aside. But, you know, Hashem, I, I mentioned um, in discussing this, the role of the international community 
um, what they can play. Is, uh, is the international community still relevant? Are they still important uh, to, to making some constructive progress on this conflict? As you know, Lucy, uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians would find it very difficult to even talk to each other without support from third parties. And this has been the case for decades. And I don't think that there has been any change in relation to that dynamic. Uh, the role of the United States has always been instrumental, not only in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It was instrumental uh, to the achievements of peace between Israel and Egypt. It was instrumental in the achievement of peace between uh, Israel and Jordan. And I think it will continue to be instrumental in addressing any aspect pertaining to the Israeli uh, Palestinian conflict as well. Uh, but the US is not alone. Uh, there is a role to be played by the International Quartet or the Middle East Quartet uh, that consists of the United States, Russia, the EU, and the United Nations. And there are other groups. There is the Ad Hoc Liaison Committee that deals with the economic development of Gaza. There is uh, the Arab Quartet that consists of Egypt, uh, Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. There is also the new established group, which is the Munich group, is, uh, consisting of Germany, France, Egypt, and Jordan. So all these mechanisms and instruments can ex be extremely helpful in trying to address some of the challenges, particularly in light of the fact uh, that the United States indicated that it will not be focusing uh, at a, a leadership level in resolving the conflict. So absolutely, I think it is very important to have uh, a role played by, by the international community in order to see how we can advance uh, this whole process uh, towards uh, achievement of peace. Let me ask you, Lucy, the most critical question facing the conflict today. What is needed to move the needle on this conflict to advance the prospects of peace? It's the ultimate question, right? What, what will move the needle? It seems like it's been stuck for so long. And I think that it's interesting to look at the fact that in Israel, we've just had after four rounds of elections, we've just seen a new coalition formed. You may start to see uh, some some opportunity open up with this new coalition. It's a, it's a it's an interesting coalition. It spans an ideological and political spectrum. The new prime minister there is not someone who is supportive of two states. He's been very firm um, and clear that that's not where he sees this conflict heading. But at the same time, it's a coalition that includes parties that very much are uh, supportive. Um, of that angle. So it will be interesting to see uh, where that changes or leaves some openings um, at, at the top down level. On the Palestinian side, um, where it looked like there may be some political movement, um, that still remains to be seen. There were supposed to be elections uh, held, parliamentary elections in, in May, and uh, President Mahmoud Abbas cancelled those. Um, at the last minute. And so as of right now, we don't see movement forward uh, in Palestinian politics, except for the fact that in the process of preparing for elections, there was a fair amount of dynamism. There were different factions that broke off from Fatah, the ruling party in the West Bank, um, and really a, a lot more uh, political dynamism in the sense that the enthusiasm when elections were slated to happen, the percentage of people who registered to vote was incredibly high. So I think that that does show us that there, there are some openings there and possibilities where we might begin to see some change going forward. But beyond that, that's still focused on the top down. That's the bottom up. And I talked about the enthusiasm of, of, of the Palestinians for, for voting. Um, the publics here really need to be engaged because you've had such a stuck situation at the leadership level for so long. This will not move forward without um, some, um, some, some push and some momentum from the bottom up. So with that, are you optimistic? Uh, you know, we've been used to all kinds of predictions in our part of the world, and I've been dealing with this issue for a number of decades. And whenever I was pessimistic, I turned out mostly to be more right than wrong. And whenever I was optimistic, I turned out to be more wrong than right. Uh, but with all what we have discussed, it is not that easy to be optimistic. But in our, you know, in our line of business uh, dealing with the conflict, uh, we can't but be hopeful and we can't but continue to see how we can uh, ameliorate the situations uh, that we are facing and see how we can advance the prospects of peace. How about you? 
Well, that's the difficult question, as you say, Hisham, and there are several uh, factors as we've discussed that mitigate against there being any quick or near-term sustainable solution to this conflict. But I think, as you also noted, the parties owe it to themselves and those of us who invest time working on this conflict have an obligation to uh, keep forging a path forward and finding, not just plowing ahead doing the same thing over and over again, but looking for the opportunities that exist, the changing dynamics, many of which you've spoken to today, that offer us opportunities uh, to try something new, um, to to bring this, this conflict to an end in a way that serves both peoples and frankly, the international community as well. There's all, there will always be a lot to discuss on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Thank you very much, Lucy. That's for sure, Hisham. And thank you. And check out our website.